November of 2019, we did not know what was starting then. It's August of 2020 as I'm taping this and we are still shattered by a global pandemia that's called COVID-19. This is a painting that was done in the 19th century. It's called The Sick Child by John von Francisco. And what we see right away in the composition, obviously, you know, the, the title is, is a giveaway. We see the sick child in bed and the caregiver by his side. So let me just talk to you a little bit about what I see on this composition. At the edge of the composition are the elements that tell us the story that this child is sick. We can see everything by the bedside table. Another element that's really important for this composition is how the child's hands are clutching on his toy. And you don't need to be told, but you know, this could be like his favorite toy a toy that gives him solace. And now an interesting thing is, in my view, uh, the individual who's sitting by his side, it's really not relating to the child. You take that element from the composition and you still have a sick child. It's almost as if the lady who is knitting by his side could belong to a different painting. And the other thing about this composition is that if you take away the left bottom corner of the painting, this child could just simply be sleeping. So in this particular painting, the composition doesn't really help that much in giving us the impression of how much diseases impact an individual or society. John Bon Francisco is not a very well-known painter. He also was a violinist and probably is better known because he was a co-founder of the Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra. So this is a very accomplished, technically accomplished painting, but in the sense of putting the composition together for a dramatic narrative, there's a lacking here in this particular painting. Let's take a look at this painting. It's called The Sick Child by Edvard Munch, painted in 1885 and 1886. So what we see here in terms of the composition is by the edge of the, of the painting, we see what seems to be a bottle and an upside down spoon that could be interpreted as the medicine for the sick child. But most importantly, the narrative is really told in the center of the composition. That child is sick. You can see the gaze of the child looking at, with tenderness, at the caregiver. There is absolutely no doubt with this gesture. It's a body language that's very, very strong and universal. This caregiver is suffering, is in grief, and the grief is due to the sickness of the child, which is further supported by that gesture of the locking of the hands. What Edvard Munch has done with this particular painting is creating a narrative that is extremely powerful without having to pay attention to the rules of perspective, the, where is the source of the light, are the forms actually described correctly by shadows? No, 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 no. He's telling us the narrative with the gestures in a triangular composition that locks us in those three elements that tell the whole tragic story. It is almost as if you want to look at the rest elements of the painting and your gaze immediately comes back to that triangular composition. The message was very strong and um, we could be deceived really by Edward Munch in what seems to be a quick and rapid brush stroke painting because it did take him a whole year to paint this particular scene 
and to produce this painting. He was very proud of it. He knew that it was very powerful. And actually, he made a second version as a lithograph, color lithograph in Paris. He further made another version that was commissioned to him, and it's in Stockholm. And the fourth version is owned by the Tate Gallery in the collection of the Tate Gallery. There is no doubt that Edvard Munch could tell us the story with a very powerful composition that says diseases have a real impact on individuals, on families, and we should not neglect the importance of preventing diseases and how important it is to treat diseases. Edward Munch contracted the flu in 1918. You know, it's almost a hundred years ago. Let's remember what happened in 1918. All of a sudden, there's this infectious disease. It was a flu, but it was killing people right and left hand everybody was falling ill nobody knew what to do there was no treatment there was not enough medical care they were in the middle of the great war now remember it was not called first world war until the second world war happened so at that time it was called the great war uh, and it was like everybody was concerned about not having sufficient support system in society to help people now, let's take a look at this painting. This is super powerful. Again, Munch is doing the same as before. He's giving us elements where you don't really care about perspective. And even the use of the colors here is, is very interesting in the way of the palette that he's using. Very, very broad brush strokes. But what do we see? All right, he is fully dressed. He seems to be groomed ready to go outside but wait a minute he's sitting by the edge of his bed the the bed is actually made and ready but he can't leave he's in isolation he's in quarantine and with very few brush strokes you can see on his face the frustration he needs to wait he needs to be patient because he has absolutely no idea when he can go out. Why were people put in quarantine and isolation? It was to protect others. There was no treatment. So these people really had no idea if they were ever going to leave alive that apartment or the house where they were in quarantine. It was such a powerful feeling for him. It was so impactful for him that a year later he did another painting. Uh, that's called the same self-portrait with the Spanish flu. Now, it is interesting to see these two paintings because you can actually see that now the bed is not made. It's a mess. He's not groomed at all. He is dressed with what you can interpret, well, I interpret as a, as a bathrobe. He's not dressed. Definitely, he's not prepared and he's grown a beard. Uh, the hair is not well done. And now he's looking at you straight in the face. He seems to also have like the mouth open. He is tired of being in quarantine or being in isolation. He is no longer hoping that he can go out of doors. The impact of the disease is so clearly depicted in these two paintings. Edward Munch had the ability to give us a narrative without really paying attention to perspective or some special rules of technique. That's why he is such a well-known artist, because he portrayed emotions. A painter that depicts the impact of disease and pain in life uh, very well is Frida Kahlo. She has a lot of self-portraits. This particular self-portrait with thorn necklace and hummingbird is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Frida Kahlo acquired polio when she was about six years old, and she has many accounts and written documentation that she does not recall any single day of her life where she was not in pain. She did have several other uh, problems, including a very bad accident, and she continually had her injuries, her disabilities, and her pain showing in all of her self-portraits. 
If you just look at her face, it could be just a regular self-portrait. But when you pay attention, you see that the thorns on the necklace are drawing blood. And so she is very clearly telling us, yes, I am looking at you, I am not showing it, but I am also telling you clearly, I am in pain, I am suffering. She doesn't hide it, she copes with it. In this other painting from Frida Kahlo, uh, you see the iconography for death in her forehead. And this is actually called Thinking of Death. It's in the collection of Dolores Olmedo in Mexico City. And again, she's looking at you, she doesn't deviate that face, that um, eyesight from the viewer, but she's also not hiding that she is suffering. And the impact of all of her disabilities that have had in her life is that she is thinking of death. Andrew Wyeth painting painted Christina's world in 1943. This original painting is at the MoMA in New York. Christina Olsen, lived with her siblings in a farmstead and they were neighbors of a farm where Andrew Wyeth would go occasionally on vacation. And he knew the Olsons firsthand. When Christina was painted by Andrew Wyeth, she was about, she was in her mid forties. So it is said that he used his own wife, Andrew Wyeth's wife, as a model for the torso because he wanted to depict a younger woman more in, more in her mid twenties. So what are we seeing here? Actually, Christina was uh, paralyzed. She was paraplegic. She couldn't move from the waist down. Uh, it is said that she either had polio or she had a Charcot-Marie tooth disease, which is a polyneuropathy and it's an inherited disease. This woman lived her whole life walking with her hands, moving herself with her hands. You can see the tightness of the muscles in her arm and you can see the dirty hands and they're crutching on the floor. Christina's world was always a perspective from the floor. That's how she lived. And it is said that Andrew Wyeth was so impressed looking at Christina, who actually would go on doing the chores in the farm, uh, that he wanted to make the whole world see how an individual that had a tremendous disability was facing the world. And in this particular composition, it is it doesn't escape you that Christina has a long way to go on those two skinny hands to get to her house. It's almost you feel as desolated as she was. So in these two cases, Christina is depicted in isolation in her disease and Frida Kahlo paints herself in isolation in her suffering. This is another painting that depicts illness and how illness can affect us. The painting is called Science, represented here by the doctor, by the, by the bedside of the patient, and Charity, represented here with the nun, by the other side of the patient. This is a super, super interesting oil painting, which is huge. It's two meters tall, which is over six foot, and three meters wide, which is over nine foot. And it's a very accomplished painting that's telling us a very strong narrative and a very, very strong story. So what we see here very clearly is this individual is suffering. She is sick. She's in bed, but she does look very sick. Just having the face alone, we would not need the rest of the composition to know that she is ill. Charity is giving her solace when what seems to be something to drink or maybe a broth for food. But most importantly, Charity is holding a child. We don't need to be told explicitly, but it's inferred that this child is the son or the daughter of the sick patient and he's looking at his mom. So Charity is actually not only giving her something to eat, but she's also in a way telling her, don't worry, we are taking care of your child. 
a very important piece in this composition, which I think it's very powerful, is how the doctor is holding the patient's hand. He could be taking the pulse just with two fingers, but he's actually holding her hand. And you can see her hand is almost a, a dead body's hand. There's no question this is one of the key elements in this composition too. In this composition, you go around the whole painting. You can actually read the whole painting and come back to the different elements. There is no question this painting is done by a super accomplished painter. You can see how he's almost bragging that he can paint the, the uh, different elements like the wall that's dirty, that there's elements in there that are not perfect, whereas he's also adding a very ornate mirror. This very, very accomplished 15-year-old painter is Pablo Picasso. And this painting is currently in the Picasso Museum in Barcelona. Besides the wonderful technique, the narrative, the composition, this is introducing elements. This is not just saying a self-portrait when I'm sick, look how isolated I feel. No, or a portrait of somebody else who's sick in isolation. This is a portrait of somebody who's sick and how society is helping. And the very, very, to me, important element is science and charity, not just one. She has a support system. This is a painting by Pablo Picasso when he was very young. Uh, and it's supposed to be his sister, Conchita. He did uh, draw Conchita in 1894 when Conchita was seven years old. And just a year later, she died of the diphtheria. Uh, she is buried in Coruña in a pauper's grave. But he was very close to disease and he was able to portray the disease, but not just disease alone, but how there's a support system that you need to have around you when you have somebody ill or a group of people that's ill. Science and charity are super important to deal with diseases. If you take a look at my YouTube channel, I have developed a playlist related to COVID-19 and vaccines. If you take a look at the video that's called Evolution, the making of vaccines, I talk there uh, briefly about how long does it take to develop a vaccine? Why did I create that particular video and why did I pose that question and answers to that question is because I was hearing that question. A lot of people were asking me, how long will it take? And it took me a while to realize that nobody really cares how long does it take to develop a vaccine. That was not the question they really wanted to ask. People really want to know when will a COVID-19 vaccine be available for me? That's the real question. So I have to say that no matter how you measure time, it's never going to be too soon. It's August of 2020 and the vaccine development has been greatly accelerated. There is a lot of promise. And what I decided to do was to create a playlist that has a lot of information about vaccines but take a look at the one, the, the video that's called Hope, Developing COVID-19 Vaccines. And I hope you can get many answers to your questions. I don't think anybody can give you a certain date, but what I can tell you are the facts and the probabilities that we will have a COVID-19 vaccine in the future. So join me in my next video and my YouTube channel. And thank you very much.